NetSpark are the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. Logarithms Netmon Freemium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. Netmon Freemium is a free commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use Netmon Freemium's powerful capabilities to search against all observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never-before-seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame. Automate the hunt. IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. Stream over 2,000 hours of up-to-date, high-quality video content live and on-demand. Premium annual memberships include all video content as well as access to virtual labs and the Q&A forums. You'd pay $85.70 a month or $857 per year, but we have a special offer for our listeners. For a free 7-day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your active subscription, visit itpro.tv forward slash security weekly and use the discount code SW30. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. This is our security news for this week. Quick announcement. Check out Wild West Hacking Fest, put on by Red Team Specialists from Black Hills Information Security. This is the old copy of the ad. Uh, it's October 27th, and here's what you need to know. It's October 27th 7th. and the 28th. Yep. Larry Pesce and Paul Asadorian are and, going to be and speaking. others and others and, and more others. will and be more. speaking. Wild West Hackin Fest H A C K I N Fest dot com. How's that? So what are you speaking on? I have no idea. I have three talks <laughs> dude, dude, that I've given. Dude, if that's your talk title, I'm so pissed because it's the same one I've got. <laughs> <laughs> dude, we should do a panel. We should. Do, yeah, we should just. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, oh, shit. at each other's speaking times, we should have a panel that's just Larry and Paul, and we just sit around and, and drink beers and talk about security and take open. Qu- we'll take open questions from the audience, wow. and we'll just sit around and drink beers, and that'll be our talk. Then we don't have to prep any slides, and we get to drink beer, kind of like why we did the podcast. We don't have to prep any slides, and we get to drink. We'd have to put a theme to it because I know John's got very much a theme to the whole sure the whole thing of very much IoT and. Sure. Fine radio we can talk IoT. Yep, we'll That's talk fine it. with we, me. We've been talking IoT for years. <laughs> it wasn't called IoT then. It was called embedded devices. Our talk will be I told you so. And then the next iteration of the talk will be I told you so again. <laughs> Dude. <sighs> you just got my talk title. I don't have a moment. <laughs> I fucking I told you so. <laughs> I have a talk that's pretty much titled that. I know you do. I even have I slides on that. We could have those slides. I know you do. We could present that together. You'd be totally fine. Um, I'm going back to this PFSense firewall thing. Yeah. Because we were having a conversation that I think is appropriate for on air, which yeah. is usually not the case. <laughs> I know. Well, they're, they're usually appropriate for on air. so many that are not appropriate for on air. Speaking of inappropriate for on air, your lemon's a little droopy. My now. lemon is definitely, yeah, I needed a fresher. That's a sad looking. <laughs> that's a, get that lemon out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get that shit out of here. I mean, well, I mean look, at the, look at this. So your <clears throat> PFSense is. In Intel Quad Core J1900, I yep. actually see. Is that is that just a Pentium or is that a Celeron? It's a Celeron. Uh, it's a Celeron. No, you're right. It's a Celeron. It's a Celeron. Celeron. Yep. Celeron J1900. Yep. Quad Core. I did see that. Yep. And it is fanless, which I love. Yes. I kind of like that for a choice. Except that I went to go buy something with that J1900 processor, and it was like end of life or something. Really? Let's see what it is on Newegg. Still available? Newegg is still available for yep. 169. 169. And that comes with RAM. And that comes with eight eight or four? Um, four. Yep. You had some RAM laying around, you said. Oh, yeah. No, so I'm sorry. It did not come with RAM. I had some four. Will it support eight? Because I'd totally throw I eight. I bet it does. I bet it does. 
Hold on. It's, if you're building a PFSense firewall, you're doing the same. It's maximum support of RAM is 16 gig, okay. which is awesome. So, yeah, it will support it. You're going through the same <laughs> thing I do. Like, if yep. you, and I'm not knocking what the, the PFSense guys are doing. NetGate and, and mm -hmm. PFSense are uh, they're doing that thing together. Mm -hmm. The one that I want was like 7 or 50 bucks. Right. Um, but that has six gigabit Ethernets. Yep. I really don't need six. And the problem is when you go a level previous to that, mm -hmm. They drop the atom processor down from four cores to two cores, mm -hmm. and you drop your RAM from eight to four. And I'm kind of like, I really just want something like three Ethernets would be awesome, like an, an external and internal, and like one extra for wireless yep. would be awesome. But I, I need we crush. We were just talking about there, there. like we crush bandwidth during the show. Like yep. we'll have multiple Skype calls, sending video in each direction. We're streaming. And then, God forbid, we want to upload the previous segment while we're doing the yep. show. Like, forget it. That's not yep. possible right now. So we the, need something that can, like, crush bandwidth. Yep. The other one, check out some of these, uh, the uh, the fanless PCs <coughs> as well, just in general. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it was Black Friday-type sales. I picked up a couple of uh, Z-Boxes. Yes. Uh, Zotac? z -box? Zotac. Z yeah, Zotacs yep. are awesome. And uh, so I, I replaced uh, our nine-year-old's uh, laptop with one of these. Which she hasn't been using. She hasn't playing, been playing a lot of Minecraft right. with. But when she does, it works perfectly fine. I have a second one that I literally is still in the box from Christmas. Right. That I have to find a project for. And I, I, I need to do something. And I, I think I've got some ideas. Um, I wish, like, System76 made, like, a fire. I'm going to give them a free plug on the show. But you know what? I know I hate to say it. And I like the System76 stuff. It will probably be overpriced for what it is. Just like... And I could. don't hate to say it, the PF Sense stuff. We could, you and I could probably do better, given that we have a little technical acumen and they can build our own stuff. Yeah, I just want something that's going to run like forever. They don't have to worry about though. Yep. And I, I feel like if I spend the seven fifty with PF Sense, like I know will. it's just going to run, and it I'm will. not going to have to. But, ever well, worry. Well, but probably what we build is probably going to run, and we're probably going to have to worry about yep. it either. Yep. So, for example, mine has been running since we've. You know, six months before we've done that article. It was episode 471. Uh, the only reason it has rebooted is because of software updates. Gotcha. All right, well, let's put it this way. It touches my UPSs nil. Uh, and yeah, the PF sets one since it drew like seven watts. I don't even know what my At idle. But, but it's, <coughs> yeah. Probably it's, not much more than that. Ag agreed. Um, some other ones to think about. Um, well, because you had the problem before where you were using like uh, embedded, what we call it, like embedded systems. Mm -hmm. And when you were doing a pen test from it, you were, like, crushing yep. it and killing now, it. That, that was my concern. That, that was the NetGate 2D2. Yes. Do you remember those? I do. The red box. The those red ones? Were, were those MIPS or ARM? Those are ARM. Okay. Uh, yep, they're ARM. Um, I think the difference is we've they've been upgraded to Intel processors. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, think about how old those 2D2 boxes are. Those they're old uh, now. I have two of them. Because we're old. And I yeah. still use them all the time. Oh, yeah. For other purposes. They're when, and awesome. they run PFSense. Yeah. And they support um, uh, PC, mini PCIe mm -hmm. and wireless adapters in mini PCIe. Oh, you can totally make them access points. That's what we use for the SANS wireless class. Host APD? Uh, no, we use PFSense. Oh, okay. As yep. the access point. And, yeah, and the and drivers are really good for that. Yep. Yeah, no, I see yep. that. And uh, they, they start to fall down after about 20 students. Mm-hmm. So I have two of them. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, I, got one, I got one on the used market for like $75 with a wireless adapter, and they work great, and they're small, and I can't complain. Maybe and I it's will do your build. Sam was kind of mentioning like my time to build it to, to factor it's, that in. It didn't take very long at all. It took you know, yeah. an hour. Right. I mean, the big part of that is finding a case that will work for it, and the case that I picked uh, that's listed there yes. um, is hard to find now. Uh, but still, there's cases for those. It's types mini of ports. ITX. Yeah, mini you can get ITX a mini case. ITX case. Yeah, I like. I don't know. If I forget who the case manufacturer is that I really like. Yep. And uh, and uh, they. Now, so for mine, they uh, it boots over. Cooler Master. Cooler Master makes awesome cases. It uh, yep. the that board boots on USB, and yep. so all so of everything's the... running over USB. And I've got one of those little teeny tiny like 128 gig. Yeah, USB yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in the list there for. That's for this. more like research to figure out. Like, yep. Well, it has uh, SATA SATA on it as mm -hmm. well. Yep. So conceivably, you could do like a 64 gig SATA would be really cheap. Anyway. Yep. Either way. Um, Either you know, way. This is one of those things. The you point could spend is hours. Well, but the point is to build like an enterprise enterprise grade firewall. Yep. Like 
you really just check out episode 471 that really tells you mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. how to do it. Uh, and we both go through the, the paces. And PFSense is a perfectly acceptable software solution that if feature-wise it does everything you need, in my opinion. Um, even on the enterprise, too. I mean, it supports some pretty serious stuff. Yeah. So like, yeah. We had and, the, and the we, founder and, of the PFSense project on at one time. Yep. We'll have to and, revisit that, I think. And uh, we were we were talking about this right before the show when uh, one of the alternatives that I'm looking towards for PFSense, just because I was looking to implement something, mm. uh, is a product called OpenSense, OPN Sense, mm-hmm. um, which looks like an open source adaptation of PFSense gotcha. based on BSD. Um, and from what I'm seeing, it looks really slick. I'm going to download it and check it out and see mm-hmm. how it works. I don't know about wireless support or any of those, but um, uh, just some alternatives to think about. You know, we, I like to give alternatives. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, where was I going after that? News stories? I had some. Yeah, I guess we can talk about the yep. news. Sure. So uh, just, a, just a quick one, Paul. Um, you know, We were talking before the show, and you're like, dude, how's things going? I'm like, dude, I worked 90 hours last week. Doing anything good? Yeah. Um, as part of that 90 hours, uh, up to this coming Friday, Sorry. so the week, so tomorrow, um, uh, I, I had one of those extremely exciting emails for me today, uh, between myself and Josh Wright, you know, and I'm like a Josh Wright fanboy. We've talked about this before on the show. Um, and today, um, for this Friday, we have course updates do to the SANS 617 wireless course. And you note that I there's a very uh, there's a there's a pronoun in there called we have an update to the SANS course. And it's uh, no longer just Josh um in that I am taking over some of the course authorship of that course. Um and it's going to be totally awesome and Josh just wrote the author notes for us and at the bottom it's very much signed, you know, hey, you know, here's some of the things in the course, and these are the things that we've changed, and these are super, these super updates and the things that we're doing. Signed, Josh and Larry. Nice. Like, dude, did that just happen? Like, I have my name next to Josh in a byline type of thing? Yeah. It's like. I'm a Josh fanboy. Wow. I've been <laughs> like, wow. Josh fanboy for a long time. Like, wow. And it was kind of amazing because we're I think coming- I, saw, I saw Josh present in. 2001, mm-hmm. 2001. Mm-hmm. Was it Oracle or was it wireless? Uh, it was Snort, actually. Really? Yes. Interesting. And it was kind of the, the funny part is that, well, I laugh about, I'm not sure Josh, maybe now he'd laugh about mm-hmm. it. I was kind of trolling him during the during the thing. I have yeah. a history of trolling Josh during yes, this presentation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like sh- sh- yeah. shoot yeah. balls at his crotch. Yes. <laughs> or, yeah. the, or the podium. You know. Yeah, either yeah. way. You know, we like to troll. As much as we love Josh, we love to troll his presentation. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that's that's absolutely the case. And, you know, Josh loves to be trolled and Josh loves to uh, troll. But on that note, he does love to troll our presentations as well. Oh, I specifically yes. remember him and yes. Mike Poor walking into one of my presentations, wearing sombreros, having Corona, yelling. <laughs> yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I do remember that. So I oh guess God. justice has been served. Yeah, for, payback for is in fact a bitch. <laughs> a bitch. Yes. Where will we be going with this? I don't know. But, I don't know. But uh, uh, yeah. So anyway. that was that was my ninety-hour week in addition to working uh, the regular hours for for my day job at Guardians. Um, you know, spending all hours outside of that doing course updates. And oh my God. It is so much work and it's so epic and it's going to be so awesome. It's awesome. Like I have stuff dangling over here that I just I saw unplugged. your your stuff dangling over there. Yeah, like and I saw your wireless gear too. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like so software defined radio and a Raspberry Pi and it's awesome. like doing the final testing to make sure that the instructor has a Pi image that they can transmit some radio stuff and You know what happened to me <sighs> in one of my Raspberry Pis recently when I put the case on? Uh-huh. It like crushed the micro SD just enough where I think what happened is it created a short oh. and it overheated and it melted the micro SD and I think some of the connections on the Raspberry Pi itself rendering both completely useless. I may have to give it to you to see if it can be saved. You I was kn- I was very sad. So it, and it's funny. I've gone through a ton of uh, uh, Raspberry Pis. We talk. We they got badges for these at CCDC one year. Yes. Um, Do students get all get a Raspberry Pi in your did, wireless class uh, now? Uh, no. <laughs> Just wait. This is the first revision of the new content type of thing. So <laughs> yeah. we've got big things planned that may not have gotten into this update, yep. but 
but we're potentially going to give away all of the stuff that we're using as instructors for free. I mean, it's there. I mean, it's all based on open source stuff, and you can put the pieces together, and why mm-hmm. not? So, um, but uh, as part of that, I, I've gone through a bunch of revisions of the Pi, the Pi Model B with the full size SD card. Mm-hmm. I would put those in checked baggage, mm-hmm. and many times what would happen was stuff would get rearranged, or the TSA would go through it, and the full size SD card would snap out of the holder. Oh. So I have a number of uh, Raspberry Pis with those original ones that do a function that I want them to with the card super glued mm-hmm. into the device itself. Like, it's broken. It's useless to me. Right. Might but as well running use as it, it is. until the SD <laughs> yeah, card yeah, fails, it, right? Or the, it's useless and I can't upgrade it and all that stuff. Uh, I've had a number of them also with the micro SDs mm-hmm. where you plug them in and the detent doesn't stay with the SD card plugged in. Mm-hmm. And you might go in, the SD card goes flying. Mm. So it's always on eject. Oh. So you put it in, bing, bing, it doesn't lock in. You know what you do there? Tape. No, you put it in, you put some hot glue. Hot glue. <laughs> Because that's remo- relatively removable. I so, got you. Um, I fixed them, and they're they're those are the devices that sit and do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Like my ADSB aircraft beacons in the attic, mm-hmm. and my temperature sensors and stuff like that. Right, right. <clears throat> that you don't care. So there's nice. always there's always a use for a semi broken pie. I got you. I'll have to see if you can resurrect yeah. mine. Yep. Um, where do we want to start with stories? Oh God, today? they're all over the place, and they they were they kind of, you know, were kind of right. weak this week. They were. <laughs> for it was interesting for Enterprise Security Weekly. John was like, "Dude, the stories are epic." I'm like, "I know." Like, it was <laughs> great news in Enterprise Security. Yep. And then I get to this show, and I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, there's some stuff there, but it's not really." Yeah. It's more interesting to hear Larry and I talk about like what we've been working on. Yep. Dare I talk about Docker? I'm not ready to talk about Docker. I want you to talk about Kubernetes. I definitely don't want to talk about <laughs> Kubernetes. I haven't gone there yet. My uh, next step is to learn how to properly use Docker Compose nice. uh, and, and, and do that. Um, and thank you to specific people who I spoke with, I believe, yesterday uh, that are, are helping with that. Um, and there's a lot of other people that I want to reach out to. I do have uh, a very an interview I'm very excited about, and there's kind of this battle going on, like, John really wants this person on Enterprise Security Weekly. I really mm. want him on this show. And it has to do with Docker, and I'm very, uh, you know who you are if you're listening, very much looking forward to interview. I'm very uh, excited about my, that. Yeah, so no, my, stay qu- tuned. My, my question is, why not have them on both? Because I think that I audience think is might, served by two different groups. I think we might, I think we might have to uh, in this case. So yeah. I have been, uh, for those that haven't been looking at some of my social media posts, which are uh, not a lot of details, mostly just hilarity, uh, basically meme images about Docker and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have been on this thing where I want to teach myself how to use Docker, and I kind of took that from a page out of, like, how I learned security, right? Like, yeah. I learned how to build systems in Windows, and then I was frustrated with that, and I was like, wow, Linux is awesome. So I learned how to build systems in Linux, and then I learned how to secure systems in Linux. Same thing mm-hmm. with Docker, and, and I really feel, well, There's a, I have a lot of thoughts on, on this whole process, but I took an internal application that we have, and some people have requested more information on it. Maybe we'll run a segment on it. Uh, it the code is not great by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and it's called, for those who want some inside baseball, it's called PP Works, mm-hmm. largely because I named it, and I really have the mind of like a, a 12-year-old. But, Don't we all? Mm, so I called it PP Works, Podcast Post Production <coughs> Works. It produces all of our, our stuff after the mm-hmm. fact. And um, it is, I have a very small amount of code inside and of you it, have thankfully. Also, and you also thankfully. have a very small PP. PP Works. <laughs> I have three kids. It works. So <laughs> what a, I did was I took that application and I'm like, you know what? It's about the wave. It's about the motion of the ocean. I'm going to put it in Docker. I'm like, screw it. And now, like in production, for the most, I think today, I think I always say, like today, we're gonna use the new one that I put in Docker. And then Mark's like, dude, I got an internal server error. I'm like, I have nightmares about internal server errors. Uh, but I did that, and I'm really glad that I did because it gave me a lot of uh, insights and learning about Docker containers and in the whole thing. So 
more to come on that front. Uh, I, as much as we joke about it, I think it's something we all have to know. Some mm-hmm. people have requested more information about our internal app, and I'm more than happy to to kind of share the high level. I'm still getting advice from people because I'm like, look, I, I this, I, it's not. There's like stuff we could do way better on multiple fronts inside of this application. But it's very much a learning experience for me. Um, yeah. To be quite, to be perfectly honest and transparent, I don't work a day job other than like doing podcasts, which means I like need to take it upon myself to go do shit that I can talk about the security of it. Mm-hmm. So, like, part I, of well, my job well, is day job between offensive countermeasures. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, offensive countermeasures is largely a management. Position. They right, don't. But they don't let me anywhere near the code. Thankfully, in that. Good. Um, but, but but hence where the startup security weekly stuff comes from. Exactly. Exactly. So, so it, it's based on my experiences. So I have to build my own experiences. And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, we have the software. So I'm going to go write a little bit of code for it. I'm going to go deploy it on Docker. I'm going to go, you know, build the web server, the app server, and and see how it all works. And then now I'm starting to think about security. And quite frankly, I'm pretty frightened um, on. Well, I'm frightened on several fronts, but I'm hopeful on several several other fronts as well. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting how it uh, it all pans out. Our upcoming interview, hopefully, will uh, shed some more light on that. But that's really where I've been spending a lot of my time. And it's been really frustrating at times, but really eye-opening and really rewarding. Like, there are some really cool things that when you do deploy an app on Docker, I'm like... Wow, that's like Dude, it winning. changes my way I think about it, right? Like, yeah. it, but in a good way, and sometimes in a really bad way. But in a, in a good way, I'm like, this this is good, this mm-hmm. is good. Yep. right. It's it's good to be sort of quote, and I, I hate to say this on the cutting edge, but uh, you're quote on the cutting edge, and you're doing things that people are really doing in enterprise, and you're getting some experience with it, and yeah, that has always been some of the things that we've been trying to do on this show is that we've been trying to keep in touch with what's going on now. By the way, I don't recommend that you take a production application and go, oh, I'm just going to put that in Docker. That, like, that's not, no, don't, you, don't do you, it that it, way. No, you take a production app and you you spend some time moving that to Docker. Oh, I did. I did, but I still don't recommend it to where or, Docker is. Or the, I, you take your new application and then you yeah. move that to Docker from the, from the get-go. And I did that. We still have the one that's running. We can always – they're running simultaneously yep. at, at, the, at, at the moment. So I had that luxury. However, I do <clears> – <throat> After I've done that and understood like what that means and, mm-hmm. and how things are deployed now and how different it is, I look at some of the security projects and I'm like, wow, if we applied like the Docker kind of concept to that, I'm like, like I was talking about when Cat with Carrie's project, yeah. I'm like, you know, like taking some of the, so I, and I don't know if there would be enough benefit here, but taking some of the subcomponents of Kali Linux and having them as containers in their own environment means you really get to define the configuration beforehand Mm -hmm. and basically spin that up and down as much as you want um, and not have to worry about reconfiguring things. And Mm -hmm. you can then also put it in different places where you might need it for a pen test. So I don't know if anyone's looking at that now, but uh, using Docker as part of your pen testing process, Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. think is something that's coming. Yep. Uh, If people are doing that now, I want to hear from you. I'd love to chat with you. And again, I'm... Um, uh, t- it's awesome. It's awesome. W- what you realize is it's awesome being a noob. Yep. For so, so many reasons. I'm like, I talk to some of my developer friends, and I'm like, I'm a total noob. And they just kind of like, they're like, oh, it's all, it's all there. It's yeah, like, we're yeah, we're noobs I'm, too. I'm like, dude, <laughs> no, I have no idea yep. what's going. So on. So my question would be, you know, we've got an, a service like uh, Amazon that will do instances of mm-hmm. a full operating system. Are there? Folks out there now that will allow you to serve a single Docker instance. Yeah, I, I believe, like software as a service for Docker. I believe Amazon does that today. I believe yeah. you can do that because that would be um, interesting. There's um, also uh, Container oh, Container Linux. Mm-hmm. I think they renamed it to Container Linux. I think it was. Was it CoreOS? Someone's screaming. It was Core, it's CoreOS, yeah. It was CoreOS, CoreOS, yeah. But they either read, I forget which name came first, Container uh, yeah, Linux. Yeah, CoreOS. It's CoreOS is the new one, yep. right, uh, that you can deploy uh, Docker on as well. Interesting. But yeah, there are, yeah. 
Okay, now, because, you know, thinking about that, about how we do our red team operations at Guardians, um, we we have an internal project that's our inter own internal stuff that uh, we use to spool up um, uh, AWS instances for any of our red team ops. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, you know, we, the, the whole in guardians thing with the matrix and it's yep. called the Oracle. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the Oracle, yeah, if you need to spin up, the Oracle spools up a AWS instances and in other potential places if needed, uh, to do any of our red team, uh, command and control stuff, mm -hmm. like click a button and brrrp, done and off we go. Right. If you need to spin up stuff temporarily, tear it down, yep. swap it out. Docker has, in my assessment so far, is like an awesome technology. Yep. We're using awesome we're using AWS and Ansible currently. Gotcha. Yep. So yeah, and then stuff. part of me is like, well, I probably could just spun up a bunch of VMs. Yeah, but there are some. <laughs> there are some. I don't know, there, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, you got to weigh the balance between a Docker container and a VM, and I'm still trying to, like, to. Quantify that to to me, yeah. uh, and, and I'm still grasping some of this. To me, Docker is like the Ruby instance, yeah, where you can run of. multiple Ruby instances on the same machine, and it totally fucks me every time. So that's why I've been resistant to doing Docker and and some of those. And <clears throat> but I'm really glad that be you're doing it. It's really a awesome. A lot of interesting conversations upcoming on that on that front for sure. 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 So was there any actual security news this there, week? There was, and uh, so I've, I mean, I've got a couple of ones that I thought were interesting, of course, mm. <clears throat> um, that uh, one of them obviously was post-exploitation with Puppet and Ansible, <laughs> given that we were using Ansible, I'm like, oh, fuck, uh, and it was very much, uh, what happens when you gain access to a, a machine that has either Puppet or Ansible on it, what can you do from there, and I thought that was pretty cool. Nice. Um, the other one... Um, that I thought was really interesting that kind of blew my mind because it's something that we've talked about on the show a lot um, is that Underwriters Laboratories is attempting to be the de facto standard for cyber certification. We talked about cyber UL in the past mm -hmm. uh, and that um, the Underwriter UL, Underwriters Laboratories, is attempting to do certification for cyber um, and in fact, um, if you go, uh, there's a there's a link, and I'll post it to the show notes later. Um, <coughs> and so it's the 2900 series of standard test to evaluate product on the fi uh, on falling criteria, fuzz testing, known vulnerabilities, uh, malware, static source code analysis, standard, static binary analysis, uh, specific security controls for access control, cryptography, remote communications, software updates, and decommissioning, uh, pen tests, and risk assessments. I mean, like, that's based on that language. That seems very, very, very robust. Um, I think we have the potential to, moving forward with mm -hmm. IoT devices, to improve the security significantly. Because mm -hmm. so many of the problems, as you and I very well know, Larry, are like totally fixable things. Yeah. Right? Like embedded default credentials. Yep. Uh, authentication issues above and beyond that mm -hmm. in the primarily the web application and web management interface. And I think that efforts such as this can really, moving forward, take care of a lot of those issues by mm -hmm. getting some standards in there. Yep. The and problem is there's already millions of these devices deployed. Uh, and, and it makes it hard. And, and now think about, you know, Underwriters Laboratories, UL. Well, um, I think about all the devices that I buy that like the UL tag for a long time was like ubiquitous. Mm. Everything I bought had a U UL tag on it, like an extension cord and a tag right. on it that said, this is UL certified. Now I go to Alibaba and I buy shit and like it has a UL tag on it and it's counterfeit. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, seriously. Or it doesn't have one at all and quite honestly, I don't care because it was $30 off the price of a $40 device. Mm. And then my device fries, fries because of, or my house catches on fire. Mm -hmm. And that's why UL was invented and type of thing. Right. Um, so 
I, I think they're doing a really great thing, and uh, I'll, I, I'm going to have to go back and do it because I didn't, but in this article, I'll, I'll post a link in the show notes um, to the actual lookups for the UL, for their uh, cyber UL mm-hmm. program. Um, there's, a, there's a huge database of all the folks that are already certified. There's a total of one entry. There's one device that is UL certified for cyber. What device is that? I don't even know. <laughs> it's, it's like it was a it, it was like a home router with a specific firmware version. Can we go get that and test it and see if there's yeah. security bugs in it? Yeah, it'd be pretty funny if there were. It would, it would. But the fact that they actually went through that process and there was some things there and yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. That because we've talked about the quote cyber UL and we've talked about the regulation of IoT and where's and it going to go? Speaking of security of the <clears throat> internet, yeah. Um, there were one wait, 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 wait. Security internet. Insecurity of the okay. internet. Yep. One million endpoints exposed on the public internet uh, had SMB. What? File sharing port four four five. Mm. Yeah. Rapid Seven did the study. What? And whatever. What I find more interesting is if you read through the article, it says that the good news is that more positive findings came from scanning port twenty three. Which is telling it, of course. Really? Researchers predicted they would see less use of port 23 in 2017. Proved to be true. Really? The Telnet scanned returned nearly 10 million responsive nodes. But get that. 10 million is a 33% drop from the 14.8 million responses <laughs> in 2016, Larry. How do you like that? Ah! <laughs> oh, wait. Wrong camera, guys. Come on now. People love telling that. <laughs> like really, <sighs> Telnet, ten million nodes of Telnet on the internet, down thirty three percent. The most exposed nations mm-hmm. on the internet. Yep, Zimbabwe. Okay, I get that. Samoa. Okay. Hong Kong. No. Romania, Ireland. Mm. I can go on, but it's the first one was understandable. But given Bel- that so gi- given gi- that they're a developing nation. Belgium was the most exposed nation in 2016, cut the number of exposed services by 250,000 and fell to the top 50. Like, right. go Belgium. Yeah. Go Belgium. But now, I can understand Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe that they're a developing nation and, and those type of things that they've got some issues. But I mean, they drink a lot of beer in Belgium. Maybe that. But Ireland? Maybe, Hong Kong? Drink a lot of beer in Ireland, too. Hong Kong? That, I have no explanation for that. Like, what happened to the Great Wall Firewall of China? <laughs> really? No, seriously. Any, 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 any allow. That's what happened. Mm, I don't know. So, yes. Do you use a credential mapper? No. Cred map? Cred map? No. Uh, open source tool uh, to bring awareness to the dangers of credential reuse. <gasps> However, I kind of like that mm. as like a pen tester tool, right? Like, <clears throat> yeah, you, you want to see credential reuse? Go and dump your database in Chrome. Oh. <sighs> And there is tools out there that you can do that mm-hmm. and see what passwords you use where. Yeah. We talked about this with the VLC thing right. when they got popped. And, yeah, I went and dumped my password manager in Chrome. <sighs> yeah, bad security I don't guy. Save, I don't save any passwords in Chrome. Yeah, not anymore I don't. Bad security guy saving passwords in Chrome and seeing about the reuse and where they were what reused. You, <clears throat> uh, Just use LastPass. I do now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, believe me, I do now. Um, For whatever but, uh, reason, I just the stories. I never trusted the browser to store mm-hmm. my passwords mm-hmm. ever. Now the browser extensions <clears throat> were some of the issues with LastPass. They fixed those very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, for me, I will I will store certain passwords with the browser. Like when I'm teaching for Sans, I will store the password for the firewall that we're using for the class in the browser because it's and then not... Dump, yeah, then dump it after you're could, done. Whatever, no, well, because yeah. it's not really a thing. Like, yeah. I, I could care less. Right. I'll recover that device in 15 minutes. Unless you've used that somewhere else and someone used CredMapper. Yeah, but no, Cred I map. don't... Uh, exactly. But I don't use that password anywhere else because that's dumb. Right. Because right. the password Because password. CredMapper does... What does CredMapper do? But it tests your credentials on other sites. Like, you can point... Uh, one set of credentials at like LinkedIn and Facebook and okay. all that stuff. So where does it determine the the sites from? Uh, Ta- you define that. Okay. 
top 1,000 sites at Alexa? Um, I'm not sure. Because that would be awesome. It lets you load a list. Uh, Crypto is using an email password and to log in. Or, uh, so you could create a list of top 1,000 sites at Alexa. You could, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. One million dollars. <laughs> Open source project written in Python. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, can I talk about a political story? Yeah. Yeah. So my story number two was from Bloomberg, which is an unusual security source, um, and about politics <clears throat> in that um, – Whatever reason we're killing the bandwidth, so my story's not coming up. But there were uh, 39 individual states that uh, reported cyber intrusions um, during their election cycle and that uh, election devices had been compromised. Um, this is bad to the point that uh, during the election... Um, while this was going on and when it was reported that President Obama, because it was during the election and President Obama was still president, picked up the cyber red phone and called Russia and said WTF because it was all attributed to uh, Russian state-based actors. 39 states hmm. attempting to influence or to hack uh, voter data. Now, they were, my understanding was they were not able to, quote, hack the vote, much like MTV wanted you to do many years ago, uh, mm. but they did have access to voter databases, including Social Security numbers. Mm. So potentially one of the largest breaches of uh, data for um, um, uh, identity theft in history. I'm just, I'm stuck on the cyber red phone. Yeah, well, so you remember the red phone. Yeah, like during the the whole nuclear crisis, there was the the phone, the red phone on the president's desk. We, dude, what are you doing? Yeah, there's quote the cyber red phone now that it's all virtual and it's like text messages. Yeah, so like he texted Putin. It was like WTF, yeah. and it was like over the cyber red phone. It was a thing that like they're doing voiceover IP and Putin like, responded with the <laughs> emoticon with the crying. <laughs> and, 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 uh, my understanding was, in fact, it actually didn't work, and they didn't receive a response for several weeks. <laughs> Seriously, Seriously. Oh, here, here's the article. Uh, Final. No, it's the emoticon where he's sticking out his tongue. That yeah. was what came back from Putin. It took two weeks for Putin to go. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much, um, yeah. So, hey, it wasn't me, man. So you know, these we, Russian we, hackers, they just they act on their own accord. I mean, they're living in the mansion that we mm -hmm. provided, but you know they do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So here it is. Damn it! Oh, fucking autoplay media. Oh. Stop. I covered a story about that on Hack Naked So News. where is it? Uh, Illinois was the first time per folks to respond, but the cyber red phone thing. Uh, let's see where it's here. Uh, the first test of a communication system designed to de-escalate cyber conflict between the two countries. The cyber red phone. Not a phone, in fact, but secure messaging channel for sending urgent messages and documents. Didn't quite work as the White House had hoped. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the White House provided evidence gathered on Russia's hacking efforts and reasons why the U.S. considered it dangerous, you know, like, dangerously aggressive. Russia responded by asking for more information and providing assurances that it would look into the matters or even as the hacking continued. Right. Yeah. So... So, yeah. He, yeah, early in 2016, a contractor who works two or three days a week at the State Board of Elections in Illinois detected unauthorized data leaving the network. Wait, two to three days a week. So did Putin get the message and be like, from Obama, you want a cyber? <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. Now, cyber had a different meaning back <clears throat> in the day. Now, the thing that I think is very interesting that I saw some of the discussion about some of this stuff is that, you know, if someone were to attempt to hack the election, the system in the U.S. is so decentralized. Fucking stop. <laughs> Close. This, <laughs> sorry, more autoplay stuff. I apparently clicked refresh. Um, but um, <clears throat> the, the voting system in the U.S. is so decentralized and so disparate 
that the attackers, in order to affect a vote, would have had to have known so many systems and so many disparate voting systems that it's ridiculous. It's like you need to go into a pen test and do an internal pen test in order to get domain admin. You need to understand how to hack 100 different I, systems. I, I hate to point to movies and TV. However, I can't help but be reminded of, did you ever watch the TV show Scandal? No. The first few seasons were actually pretty good. The uh, If you haven't watched Scandal and you want to, like, don't listen to what I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give you a minute to fast forward or whatever. So basically, the plot line that plays out in the first season or two is the uh, elected president, it comes to light, has basically hacked the vote. But the way they did that was essentially insider threat. And they, since it was an insider threat, they knew which voting systems they had to skew based on the areas that they knew the president Mm. were going to be weakest. And it was basically like swapping out an SD card kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was a a more physical attack. Still Mm -hmm. a hack, Mm -hmm. but a a physical attack. And I just, I'm always reminded of that when we talk about hacking the vote. And that I think, although it's fictional... Like really, truly being able to influence the vote requires how many a lot of insider knowledge, right? How many how many of these fictional attacks are we seeing seeing on TV are based in reality? And I hate to say it, all the way down to CSI Cyber, fucking all of them. They're they they all have some basis in reality. I don't know about CSI Cyber. Well, no CSI Cyber as opposed to what's that other one that we talked about with the Ethernet on the airplane? Oh God, no, that's not even like so. Don't C- even. That's C- not. CSI Cyber. All of their attacks were based in Scorpion. Based, that's based Scorp- in reality. Scorpion. Scorpion. I don't know. I haven't seen it. But that's the one with the airplane. Yep. CSI Cyber were based in reality. Uh, based loosely. Based. Say, based. You get loosely. Reality. Loosely based. Yep. Uh, as compared to Scorpion. Scorpion's like purely fictional. That's my, fiction. I rest my case. Yeah. One. Did the defense you, rests. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see? Is it breakthrough on National Geographic? Maybe it break. Hold on, I, I I get the name wrong. It's break break the one with uh, Jason Street. And, yes. Um, yeah, I haven't watched that yet. You haven't, but I had no. I, had, I heard they did a dude. I've been working ninety hours a week. Where, the last, where, 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 you know, yeah, I know the world's smallest violin. That's why I get paid the big bucks and. So I'm famous on the internet, but uh, yeah. So Jason Street did and uh, Jason some Street, uh, Aki- Akil, uh, Khalil Hosuani, Khalil, 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 and Darren Kitchen. Yep. Um, Dude, why does Darren get all that? Because Darren's awesome. Oh well, he, he basically creates the user friendly version of a lot yeah. of the, the hardware that lets you but, do all that stuff hey, for sure. So let me put it this way: Do you remember the day that we sat in a bar after ShmooCon? With Darren and, quote, the other guy? Yes, I do. And talked about shows and yeah. how they started the show. And so, you know, you, Darren, and I go way back. And, you know, they're very no, much No, he was certainly at, at the beginning in, in 2005 when, yeah. you know. They, they were there. Hack 5 was, it was us and Hack 5, really. But they've certainly, like I said, created those user-friendly versions yeah. of uh, a lot of the techniques that we've yeah. talked about over the show uh, for some time. That's a great guest. They need to have Darren. Be a cool guest. Darren um, we have, need to have Darren and Sharon on together. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Open invitation. Yeah. Um, they and in the show they basically break into a bank in uh, Beirut, Lebanon. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's, it's pretty cool to watch. They also track another group of uh, journalists that are pretending to be part of ISIS to collect information, mm. passing mm-hmm. that to uh, authorities. Then they do some other hack. It, it's a really good show. It's it a really is. good. Um, it's very well done. They spend a lot of time putting together those segments mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, for sure, Ab- absolutely. And from what I heard, it was fantastic. I haven't Jason's seen it. The, Jason's like the star, though. He, he steals is, he is. He, in the like, show. He steals the the state. Is. I mean, they show like if I could ever have footage of like getting ready in the morning to go do a social engineering thing, like it would look like what they did for Jason. Like he's got the, the watch and he's suited the whole thing. 
I mean, awesome. Jason so much plays himself down that it's unbelievable, and he doesn't realize it, but he's so well-spoken, and he's very much a, 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 a spokesperson for our industry. But what I realized about Jason, though, that was the uh, <clears throat> amazing thing in this segment mm-hmm. that I watched, and I encourage everyone to watch it and share it with all of your non-security friends, as I've already done as well, um, is that... Jason is such a likable person Oh yeah, that it's not like the reason that you and I like Jason because he's in security and largely mm-hmm. we talk security stuff with him most of the time. We talk about other stuff too, mm-hmm. but like we talk security and we're like, well, I really like Jason. That aspect of his personality doesn't just translate to security stuff that yeah. we're talking about with Jason. When Jason walks into a place and people don't know him, mm-hmm they already have this comfort level with him, and it's just the way he carries himself. Dude, he freaking walks into a bank, and he walks behind the teller station yep. and starts plugging USB keys into all of their systems. Mm-hmm. And I want to say that like not, uh, out of all the branches they tested, only one branch challenged him. Yep. All the other branches were like, oh, sure, how can I ha-? They were like helping him plug all of the USB mm-hmm. keys in. And I'm like, dude, that, like, not everyone can do that. And yeah. I, I, that's one of the things about the show. I'm like, like, don't think that like any of us, like Larry and I could walk in and like, I start, I don't know about you, Larry, like I couldn't walk in and pull that off the way Jason did. Yeah, well, like, that's but, a special. But let's put it this way. You could do that better than I could. I and, and, I, and, right. No, you, you could based on our physical appearance. Mm. You know, that's I, true. I, I have Jason some, was dressed in a suit. But now, now that said, I put me in a suit and I still look like a tattooed and pierced monkey. Yeah, <laughs> I mean seriously, there, there. I don't know. We could give you one of those like neon green vests, which yeah, also in a social engineering setting, mean you just get to do whatever yep. you want. It's uh, amazing proven, how proven. it's amazing how yep. a neon green vest and a hard hat and a hard hat. You can walk into like any building of any major corporation and be like, yeah, I need to just get in the data center. Like, oh yeah, let me get it, that door. For by you. the way, both of those need to be dirty. Yes. You can't walk into brand new shit. Yes. I was talking to someone who was in law enforcement, um, DA actually, for a while. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, it's like my you know, first day in the job and you know, DA. And I get issued a, a revolver to uh, you know, conceal mm-hmm. carry and, and keep yeah. with me. And he's like, the person who was training me took the thing. And he's like, we got to go out back. He's like, why? He's like, uh, you got to get a break in your gun. He's like. I thought the like the training range was like in the mm-hmm. basement or something. He's like, he took me in the back, takes my brand new pistol, mm-hmm. you know, obviously unloaded, right, and takes it and hucks it down the alley. <laughs> and it's brand new pistol skipping in the dirt and the muck on the Whoa. concrete. And he walks over and picks up and hucks it the other way <laughs> on the other side, and like kind of like rubs all of, like the dirt in yeah. on it and grime and, yeah. and stuff. And hands it back to me. He's like, all right, now you can carry this undercover. <laughs> He's like, because no one's going to, he's like, you're going to die your first day on the job if anyone sees a brand, a brand new, new shiny gun. pistol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's the same thing about your gear that you're using for social engineering. Like, yeah, don't, let's it can't look new. shiny. New. Yeah, it's got to look as it's been dude, used. Dude, my, my yellow vest has been bungee corded to the back of my truck for like a year. Yeah. <laughs> like, Perfect. Seriously. Perfect. Um, Take your hard hat and do this, throw it down the yeah, alleyway, I, throw it down I, your driveway. I let the kids play with my hard hat. Yeah. And I put stickers all over it. Like, yes. So it's funny. One of the stickers on my hard hat is from the... It's not radio. a hack naked sticker. No, it's not. give you away. So the radio station from Alaska in the coverage area where Bruce used to work. Oh, nice. Yeah. Bruce. Shmukon Bruce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bruce Potter. That's yeah. awesome. So they, a number of years ago, they had at uh, Shmukon, they had a bunch of stickers from all of the, the local Alaskan mm-hmm. area. And one of them was the radio station. On the... on the And out they go with the kids and... Kids play with and like I hard. said, you can walk into any corporation in that hard hat and a yep. neon green vest. Yep. It's one of those, like, those are the few, th- like, the kids are required to clean up their toys from the driveway and stuff mm-hmm. when they're all done on the weekend. No, oh, the Daddy, hat. we're going to put the- No, don't. I'll back over the hard hat. It's okay. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's, okay. it's fine. Yep. Don't worry about it. It's turtle. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yeah. No, it's great. I, I do encourage everyone to go watch that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, full disclosure, Jason works for Pony. Yes, Pony's, Pony's a sponsor, right? Yes, he does. Yeah, so I'm not, just Absolutely. full disclosure, Jason's Jason's awesome, just in general. Buying pizza. And diet was he work? I don't know if he was working at Pony when he, he is. Did, when he did the segment. Yes, though. he was. Was he yep. the whole time? Yep. He's working on it for a long time, though. Yes. Yep. 
Yeah, they've been working for a long time. I've seen the evolution of Khalil. He and Khalil work on Facebook from working at the, the with this bank, um, and uh, knowing the segment was coming, the segment got announced, and he's been working for uh, Pony, I think, pretty much the whole time. Mm. So, Khalil's going to come on the show. He's budged to come on the show as well. Awesome. <coughs> I spoke awesome. with him today on Facebook. Awesome. Yeah, Khalil, Khalil's awesome. And, uh, you know, there's a number of episodes back where, like, we can't remember the guy from Israel that's like, it's fucking Khalil. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Paul, one other thing. No, I don't want to talk about it anymore. No, I, it's been more fun there's, talking there's, about there's one not thing. stories than it has there's, stories. No, <laughs> come on. There's one thing that's fun to talk about. All right, let's talk about it. Story number three for you. Um, Hold on. Damn. Inside a porn pimping spam oh, bot. <laughs> Come on. What what's episode what? goes by of Security Weekly that we don't talk about porn? Well, yeah, it tends to get our attention. Uh, what's interesting what? is, well, Br- Brian Krebs says that <laughs> um, for several months I've been poking. Now, he, Brian is awesome. We found him on the show. Yes. And he makes some very subtle references. Innuendo. Innuendos. Innu- He's taking like a page out of Security Weekly for this post. Because here, get this. The title is Inside a Porn Pimping Spam Botnet. Yep. And I quote, his first sentence yep. in the blog post is, for several months, I've been poking at a decent sized spam botnet that appears to be used mainly for promoting adult dating sites. I mean... Like, props for Brian for using the word poking inside of a blog post that has porn in the title. Yep. Like, dude, like, you're, you're uh-huh. winning at, at the internet for so many reasons. That's just a, a very small one like mine. I mean, anyway. Wow. But it works, right? But, like, a dating <laughs> – adult dating sites, is that porn? That was my hmm. – Day, that was the thing. I guess adult, he means erotic dating sites. Or is there a? I think that. Well, I think adult and erotic are pretty much. There's a pretty much synonymous. There's a scale of dating sites apparently. From like, is there like a scale from like legitimate to? I'm a. Do, we, so, dude, we're married dude, and faithful, we're, so we're, we have no fucking idea. We're, we're old and like married. I have no, no idea. We're, we're like, old. We're married, and we're faithful. That's right. And so I don't know what an ladies, adult dating site ladies, is. Ladies, remember that. <laughs> That's men. Remember that. This is the 2000s, right? So I don't really know what an adult dating site is. I thought of an adult as like you're an adult and you're going on a dating site. Huh. Like match.com. Is that – that's like an adult dating – or is it like adult friend Grind, finder? Gr- no, I'm like Grindr. Grindr, is that – but every – like you should be, be on Grinder, and I'd be. You on should be an adult <laughs> if you're on an adult dating site. I would think, or does adult? No, well, well, adult is it, 18. But like adult movies are not like movies that adults watch. Adult movies have a meaning that like it's a like an X-rated like there's porn movies. Mm-hmm. Like adult movie and a porn movie is there a difference? Is it a porn dating site? Is it a sex date? I don't understand. I think it depends on the industry. I don't get it. Oh no! You get it. You got three kids. Well, you don't get it anymore, <laughs> at least three but times. You got it at least three times, right? Um, That's pretty good for a nerd. <laughs> he also says thanks to a tip <laughs> from an anti-spam <laughs> activist. Uh, apparently, cyber eroticas. Now, see when the parent company is cyber erotica, I get where he gets. Oh wait, wait, wait! They stretches way <laughs> back. <laughs> The jokes, they just write themselves. Brian, all new respect, brother. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. Uh, we're actually speaking with Brian <laughs> uh, about a, a thing. A thing. A thing that we got going. That's follow the honey. Follow yeah. the honey is one of his subtitles. Brian, what is going on? What is going on? Brian, I think he needs to come back on the show. He does. No yep. pun intended. <laughs> yep. Production crew was just talking to you. I didn't hear what they said. No, I didn't. I don't think I want to know. Anyway, next uh, story. Oh, my God. Working backwards. Uh, do we have anything else? They said they uh, <sighs> they used Nmap, which, by the way, 7.5.0. Five, yeah. Because I went to, um, and we're going to have her on the show. She is part of this project, Security Wizards. Uh-huh. Secure. It, was, it was very interesting while you're digging that up. Uh, you know, uh, Fyodor and I are friends on Facebook, 
And uh, he said, you know, here's a 7.5 release. I'm going to the park and took pictures from uh, Gasworks Park in Seattle, which is arguably one of my favorite places to go in Seattle and then the, the Fremont uh, district in uh, Seattle as well. It's one of my favorite places there um, to the point that we're actually considering relocating to the greater Seattle area. Um, of all the places I've traveled, uh, being a traveling consultant, uh, Seattle has, and the greater Seattle Pacific Northwest area has really grabbed, grabbed us. So it's, uh, it's great to know that there are lots of great people there. And, uh, I think, uh, in fact, um, uh, Fyodor may have been sitting about in the same spot that we had pictures taken with, uh, with the family, uh, cause it's fairly famous. Ah, security wizardry. Securitywizardry.com uh -huh. forward slash radar. I'm just told this this was 55 minutes, and that's yeah. that's okay because we're going old school in this we're episode. Fine. We're totally, totally old, old school. school for a lot of reasons. Um, you got to go with the gold front sometime. Securitywizardry.com forward slash radar dot htm uh, is a site that I was actually working on building. Like I wanted to uh -huh. collect all of my security the news. Pew, is this the pew pew map? Pew 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 pew. Is it pew or pew pew or pew 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 pew? It's map like where the where the threats coming from and where they. No, but it's more about uh the security alerts. So like what software has vulnerabilities, the security news, the they also have a section for virus news, latest tool versions, which is where I picked up that Nmap. Uh, seven five came from today, June fifteenth. Yep. Uh, was seven point five point zero was released today. Um, latest IDS signatures. They've got an app for iOS and Android that can hmm. get this, and they show pictures of this like running in a lot of uh, socks run by the government and stuff like that. So and it's like the kind of anti pew pew map. It's anti pew pew. Interesting. Yes. Huh. So I, I thought it was really cool. You cool. Know, I wanted to tell people to check it out. Security wizardry. Dot com oh. and uh, we are pew pew map. hopefully oh. in my barrage of direct messages and tweets and Facebook and all that stuff are going to have uh, the person behind that on the show. Excellent. That's all I had. Cool. On that. Um, you got anything else? Stories. Yeah. I you got anything security news related? Mm -hmm. We talked about security, but. <clears throat> I think that's really it. <clears throat> I just wanted to get... Can I give a shout-out on the show? Yeah. Dude, dude, it's our fucking show. We can do whatever the hell we want. This is true. <laughs> You're asking me. On my desk. I don't, I don't know if you guys have... Uh, you can grab that on my desk. It's a black box. It says Norn Audio I on like, it. I like black box testing. Um, in my bag, there's a the, the actual <laughs> headphone cable. But the, uh, So this dude, Trevor... Yep, so you've been totally getting into the hi-fi audio and mobile totally audio stuff. And my advice, I don't know, in my bag in the front pocket, there's a little thing with my, my headphones in it. Oh, you can get, get the cable. The um, so uh, I don't recommend you get into high-end audio because it's just... It's like it, buying a boat. It's like taking a boat, taking a hole in the water and throwing money in it. It's really expensive. Um, yeah. I don't recommend you get yes, into... Yes, yes, that's, that's I, it right there. So that, that said, I also don't recommend that you get into knife making because it's also like a hole in the water you throw money into. Yeah. And yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. Then so um, well, so I you know I have new gear showing up all the time for yeah. knife making and but like if you're gonna if you're gonna get into it like go all out and yeah. one of my friends if you're gonna uh, do it do it right my friend Walt recommended uh, this site and um, he encouraged me to say hey dude when you place an order like reach out to the guy and ask what the status is and you know ask how he's doing and kind of like have a conversation and this is like a very different. Shopping. Yeah. It's a personal experience. It's a personal experience. And when you're buying like a really expensive cable like this, like having that personal experience is is, is kind of cool. Please don't tell me you went down the monster cable route. No, okay, no, good, no. Good, this good. is okay. like, no. It, well, what's interesting is all of the things that we've said about monster cable and those types of cable in the past, if what you have on either end of the cable mm -hmm. is of the quality that can take advantage of the quality of the cable, mm -hmm. then it matters. Other than that, yep. you can't hear the differences. Mm -hmm. But and Now that said, the cable that passes ones and zeros will always have the same ones and zeros. But, however, if what the output is on the end of that cable 
and what is on the input of that cable is mm-hmm. of really high quality. Uh-huh. And what's on the output is really high quality? Yes. What's Good. in between, yep. you'll hear the difference. Okay. I, I shit you not, dude. Okay. Like, I can... I can hear the difference in the cables. Okay. Um, so uh, Tre- I'm, Trevor turns I'm, I'm out. I'm half tone deaf, so. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not going to be able to hear the yeah, difference. No. But, so Trevor from Norn Audio, uh, turns out Trevor used to work in IT. I've, ex- nice. I've ordered two custom cables from him. And I just wanted to make a note about uh, how awesome Trevor is uh, and give him a shout on the show. The packaging is unbelievable. It comes in like a, a, a box with his logo on it. Mm-hmm. It's like a ritual when you get the cable. You have to cut open the sticker. Inside of it, he gives you like oh. the, the eyeglass cleaning thing yeah. that it's wraps the whole thing. And then uh, on the inside, uh, it's in a, a static bag. And on the inside of the static bag, inside the box... He gives you like a special, ca- like he makes Jeez. you feel special wow. for your purchase. Um, and Carbon. not only is Trevor awesome, uh, it takes a, a while to make your cable, uh-huh. but it's a they're custom all custom cable. made, right? They're all handmade, mm-hmm. um, but it, it, it's just it's just gorgeous. And, and when you get it, you're really appreciative of the quality. Uh, and since Trevor was in IT, uh, the reason we got started on that was the first cable I ordered, I said, you know, kind of color-wise, mm-hmm. I was choosing colors that match the Security Weekly logo. My mm-hmm. other cable for my other uh, headphones uh, is actually black and red. Nice. Uh, and he's like, oh, I looked at your website. It's like I used to do IT and all this stuff. And he's like, I, I do audio cables now. So uh, I just wanted to give him a shout-out because he's a fellow uh, person in IT nice. who's pursuing <clears throat> his passion uh, in cable. So if you're into high end audio stuff, mm-hmm. I highly recommend you go to Norn Audio N O R N E. N O R N E uh audio dot com uh and order a custom cable from Trevor. It's worth the wait. Uh and you will get just the most amazing cable nice. ever. Nice. Ever. So my my recent hobby that uh Mr. Mike Poor of you're Sans, like that's like making swords. And Sans, stuff. Well, I haven't been making swords, but Mike's been making swords, and um, I get to go out and spend some time with Mike. And uh, I got to make my first knife, and I've since made a second one. And I'm working on a rehab project for a World War II um, machete. Nice. And the, my oldest daughter wants to make a neck knife, and it's been totally awesome. But you saw my first attempt at a knife. Yes, and uh, cool. that that was with Mike, um, and you know I'll show you this picture. But this is this is my second attempt at a knife. Nice. Um, and for me, then the knife, you know, the knife is not particularly fantastic in that it was a uh, it was a blank of Damascus steel. Uh, but for me, the handle, the handle was absolutely the 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 brilliance of it. Um, it was some wood that came out of a um, 110 year old barn nice. that was being torn down and it was oak so it's 110 year plus old oak and i mean the board is this wide so it's probably 130 year old oak that i got to trim down and use for the scales for the handle and sand down and it has some family history and hmm. so for me for me that's the my first knife that I ever did on my own and it's mm. beautiful and uh the the next one that I'm working on is a rehab project from uh it was a World War 2 uh surplus machete that my grandfather mm-hmm. owned um and had been used well used mm-hmm. and had um uh plastic and not plastic handles um what's the precursor to plastic what was that that was um Bakelite. It had Bakelite handles on that. it. Yeah. yeah. So Bakelite is an all-natural product, but mm-hmm. not petroleum-based. Mm-hmm. So it's the precursor to plastic. It had Bakelite handles on it that were misaligned and then tape wrapped around it. And we use this machete all the time during the summer mm-hmm. for clearing woods and stuff. And uh, I'm in the process of rehabbing that and making that, quote, new. Mm. And uh, my new sander just showed up today. You're going to put wooden handles on it? Yeah, I'm going to put yeah. some nice, nice, some decent wooden handles on it that actually line up and are comfortable to use. Yeah. And, um, but you can tell the quality of the, the build between the Damascus blank that I had mm-hmm. versus the stuff that came out of World War II. That yeah. was basically, ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. Yeah, they were like, just stamping it out. Like, yeah. And I, so, like, the hardness of this blade, mm-hmm. I am, I, I don't even have to heat it. I put it on the sander and get it hot with the sander from sanding it, mm-hmm. and I can straighten it. Oh. So it's, yeah, it's not terribly hard. That said, I'm in the process of building a forge, to be able to reharden that type of stuff. Oh, like this that's is interesting. Like so this is one of the things that my boss many years ago said to me in IT. 
he said you need to have a hobby. Mm-hmm. I'm like, dude, I've got a hobby. It's computers. He's like, no, no, no. no. You, need to have, you need to have a hobby that's not technology related. Mm-hmm. And his thing was, um, his thing was that he would rebind books, and he said every tool in his workshop was no newer than seventy years old. Like, the technology that I'm using, outside of the fact that I can do sanding faster and grinding faster, is hundreds of years old. Yeah, it's fire. And it's application of a coarser material to a finer material. Absolutely. And it's it's amazing. And with that, I will conclude. We'll call this security news, but not really. <laughs> it's, it's security old school. It's security old school. That concludes security old school or non-security old school. Uh, Paul Security Weekly is in the can. Larry, take us out. Over and out.